Arc Knights Enfield just launched its technical test and your boy got accepted to play it. Now unlike 99% of technical tests and betas, this test looks like it's actually meant to improve the final product. I say that because most companies do a beta a month before the game drops and then they try to tell us that shit is meant to improve the game. Like we somehow ain't know it's coming out faster than the Cult of Suzerain can do this whenever she appears for 0.3 seconds on a live stream. Most betas are simply demos that advertise the game, but since we don't even know the release date of Enfield and these sent out countless in-game surveys and even have a feedback channel in the discord then yeah I'd say they actually give a damn about feedback which is why in this video I want to say all of my major feedback for the game and also give a lay down on what the game's like because there's some stuff that caught me by surprise the combat being the biggest one I expected it to be closer to an action game and I mean okay yeah it is an action RPG but at the same time Devil May Cry 5 is labeled as a father-son bonding game despite Virgil trying to go for the latest stage abortion known to man that is to say if you expect something close to Punishing Grey Raven or Honkai Impact 3rd you're gonna be disappointed. As the game doesn't feel like that, the best way to explain the combat is it's basically a light MMO. It's like you took Final Fantasy XIV and made it somehow less furry. That's what you can expect from the combat, and honestly, I fucking love it. I'ma keep it 100. At first I thought the combat was ass. When I only had two people in the party and battles consisted of me holding left click in between mashing skills off cooldown, yeah, I wasn't the most neurologically stimulated by that experience. But with time, I leveled up my skills and got four people in the party, and then I came to a realization. One that made me love the game. The realization was that this is the closest I've ever played to Jujutsu Kaisen as a video game. Now you may ask yourself, holy shit, were you doing some cool ass strings and launching off domains left and right? And to that I say, fuck no. It was close to Jujutsu Kaisen because I was jumping bitches. I would dead see one solitary enemy 1,000 meters away and pull up four ultimates on their ass immediately. Most games try to have a sense of honor behind what you do. You're the chosen one who only has battles in which you are outnumbered. But in this, you are four people ready to jump sentient rocks because they stopped you from excavating natural resources. And jokes aside, yes, it's actually pretty damn fun. At first, you simply use skills off cooldown, which then gives you a skill point and eventually you can throw out your ultimate. But between that, you're just Mario Party mashing left click. Though with four people, it feels like you're actually doing something interesting for the battles, actually setting up combinations for what to do. And there is depth behind just having four people jump the local innocent wildlife. There is different effects like knockback, lift, and knockdown, which have benefits depending on how you use them. With the lift, if you use it on a knockdown enemy, they take additional break. And break is the bar below their HP, it's basically a stagger. But the thing is, when they're lifted and you knock them down, they also take additional break. And because of that, your boy cooked up an optimal rotation. Now my team was Ember, cause she's a redhead, Avuena, cause she's broken, Angelina, cause this gift makes me cackle whenever I use her ultimate, and the administrator. Yes. That's their actual name. The rotation is start channeling Angelina's ability, then knock the enemy down with Ember. From there, Angelina lifts them up, they take extra break. Now that they're in the air and begging for mercy, have the administrator slam all of them into the concrete floor. And after that, the whooping is still not done, cause then Avuena comes on in and targets any enemies close to a wall with her knockback. As when you knock an enemy into the wall, they take extra damage and break. So in layman's terms, the rotation is literally a make em eat dirt, throw them into the heavens, a slam them down to the earth's core with 5,000 pounds of force, then take the fine paste that was once a human being and throw it into the wall. You know, I was trying to make some jokes that we were actually evil in the game because we jumped people in a 4 to 1 battle, but I'm beginning to think that's not a joke. When I say what we do to the enemies out loud, we kinda seem like a bunch of assholes. And that's not even counting the many nuclear reactions we set off in battle. See, the thing is, in case you thought to yourself that we weren't brutal enough yet, yeah, let me talk about the elemental fusion system. So some moves have a chance to generate an elemental orb. From the tech test, there were three different elements, pulse, lattice, and thermal. Different combinations trigger different effects like combust, petrify, radiate, yeah, we're committing world crimes on the battlefield. Now I know the element names I already stated kind of sound as though they violate the Geneva Convention, but if I were to bet, I'd say more elements will be added with time. Either when the game fully releases or later on in its lifespan. I mean, shit, look at Ark Knights. They've added in a ton of classes and status effects after the game's launch. I expect them to do the exact same for Enfield. So what you're seeing here will probably be expanded on later. But I can say that what we have right now is really damn fun to play. It's like I said prior. Don't expect a huge action game like Punishing Grey Expect an action game that focuses less on how fast 
fast it is, like having to do quick dodges or parries, and expect a more strategy based game. You'll be thinking about where the best position for your skills are, what abilities to use, and in what order to maximize damage. How to properly get off your pursuit attacks, which are these conditional attacks that do really good damage. Some are a simple attack after the main skill, but there are some like Angelina's where you get 8 seconds of empowered attacks after your ultimate, which means to make perfect use of it, you don't want any other skill to go off cooldown in those 8 seconds as when you switch characters, you lose that attack state. And in addition to thinking that, your strategy may change if an elemental orb is spawned in via a skill, and getting an ultimate may change your rotation entirely. For example, I like to have a Vuena hit last for my rotation, but if her ultimate is up, I want her to go first, as she throws her spear into the ground and any skill that hits it causes an elemental reaction. So all of this is to say that the game does something I love and wish any rotation based games do. It has mechanics behind its combat which actually makes you think. Now I know that sounds like the stupidest shit you've ever heard, but let me explain. In many games where you have a rotation for your characters, it can get very static. That is to say, that shit never fucking changes. I've played Genshin for about a year at this point and the rotation I've used for my teams has been the exact same for any combat encounter. Yelan EQ, Kazaha EQ, Layla QE, Hu Tao E, and left click. I don't have to actually think for that rotation. Granted, I had to think when setting up the team as Genshin's team building is very in-depth, but I don't feel that translates too well into gameplay as I've constantly been doing the same thing for about a year. But in my experience of Enfield, the combat encounters haven't felt really similar. I mean, shit, the skills are all off cooldown at different times, so if anything, my rotation I talked about earlier is more of an opening because if I try to use the skills off cooldown, then it'd be a completely different rotation. And then shit like ultimates being generated, orbs being dropped, have also made me constantly think, what's best to do right now, instead of being able to follow a rotation I've done a thousand times before. And that's not even taking into account how you might want to hold onto a skill to interrupt an enemy's attack. As if you hit them with a skill while these red circles are out, then you stop their attack and deal extra break to them. The only problem with that is when you're holding onto a skill and just regular attacking the enemy, it really feels like you're actively healing them. The basic attacks do almost no damage to where I feel like I'm sitting the enemy down on a warm towel and turning into a full-blown masseuse as I lightly brush my weapon upon them. What I'm trying to say is that basic attacks need to deal more damage as right now it seems like those are unimportant and you just wait for your skills to be up. Now all in all, Enfield's combat is if you took an action game and slowed down the pace to focus on making it more strategic. That is what you can expect from the game. Not everyone will like it. Hell, the only guarantee is that you'll hate the beginning of the game as playing it with a party of two was the most boring shit ever. But I can say that so far I really like the gameplay. Part of that is because I can have four anime girls jump people like they're from the streets of Detroit, but the other reason is because the combat constantly has me thinking of what is best to do. I don't have many moments where I can actively be receiving a lobotomy and still hold up an optimal rotation. However, none of this is to say that I fully love the combat in the game and it has no flaws, because by god there is some. The greatest is a lack of a dodge. That's right, you cannot dodge. We may have traversed to a different planet, but the concept of rolling is still only tied to gacha. Now the weird thing about a lack of a dodge in game is that it feels like it was made with one in mind. You can see outlines of where enemies are going to attack and bosses usually follow a set pattern for their attack so people who are used to them can adapt and start dodging. Yet that shit is more absent than my heterosexuality after seeing Ansel's new outfit. And the worst part about the dodge is how the regular swings feel. They feel clunky as hell. Like you need to give a second for your character to actually move after you finish attacking. And for normal attacks there's a slight delay between clicking and the move coming out. In fact there are many small delays due to enemies animation locks. It's hard to really show them, but when you're playing, it feels very apparent. Though I'm like 99% sure most of the animation locks are going to be fixed before the game actually releases, but I did want to talk about them. Although the greatest thing that I would like to see is the ability to dodge. I mean, in one of the surveys, they literally asked, do you want to dodge? So I'm pretty confident in saying the no players want it. I mean, shit, we already got dodge light version. It's called jump. That interrupts the lag in normal attack animation, so it's your best bet of getting out of an AoE. That, or you're going to face tank the hit. Face tank it because blocking is, uh, yeah, non-existent as well. I don't really know why it isn't a thing in the game. Lack of being able to dodge or block makes fights feel less about what your skill is and more about having the stats to deal with the enemy. It's kind of like a turn-based game. In most of them, your only option is to just take the enemy's hit and have the stats to survive and then beat the enemy's ass. Lack of being able to dodge or block makes fights feel less about what your skill is and more about having the stats to deal with an enemy. If you don't, you simply die. That's kind of what Enfield feels like. In games like Elden Ring, you could do a level 1 challenge. If you're good enough, you'll have the ability to dodge all damage, but in Enfield something like that is not happening. Now I'm not saying the game needs to play like Elder Ring, I'm just asking for more tools to be given to the players so they can make up for a difference in stats by being skilled. Now stuff like fixing animation lock or adding in dodges slash blocking is something that seems relatively easy to add on. It's not as if it's fundamental to how combat is, so I'm not terribly worried if it will exist when the game releases. One thing I'm worried about though is more behind the systems of the game, like how orbs are really random to generate. Angelina's skill has a 20% chance to generate an orb. The thermal set gives a 
50% efficiency bonus, so Angelina has a 30% chance instead if you got the 4 piece set on, but that is still really low. And if I don't get that proc or have Avona's ultimate up, then I don't really get to play with the orb system, which feels weird as in the future I'd imagine it'll be meta. I mean, fuck, it gives a resistance shred, who does that remind you of? There is Zahi whose ultimate generates one orb, which when you compare the amount of reactions you're able to do, she feels like a worse Avona. But I'm worried that since orbs are RNG dependent to generate, in the future we will get a character who can generate an orb with a skill guaranteed, and that will power creep so many units who still have a small chance to generate an orb. Cause when you have a system tied to RNG so you can interact with it, any character who ignores that RNG will immediately be the best, especially when the system grants so many benefits like resistance and physical shred. Yeah, let me put it in Arknight's terms. Leonard has a skill that inflicts resistance shred on hit. Now imagine that has a 20% chance to happen, yet Aefiala has that shit guaranteed to happen on her skill. Who do you think is outright better? And even beyond that, relying on RNG to play with what's seemingly an integral system mechanic is whack as hell. You want players to be interacting with that shit at all times, not a fifth of the times. Which is why I'd like to see the overall effect of orbs be brought down but make them guaranteed to spawn. So instead of making it a 50% shred, instead make it a 10% shred that you can stack with consecutive applications of Electrify. I'm not saying that's concretely what I'd like or that it's the best choice with what to do for the system. I'm basically just spitballing. But I can say for certain that making orbs RNG based means players will either not care to bother with the depth of the elemental system, as many don't wish to rely on RNG, or in the future a character will be able to easily guarantee spawning orbs which will be overpowered as hell and a must stay in any team comp which is hell for a 4 player max party. And the players who don't have that character will think the game is incredibly restrictive and simple in what they can do as they are not able to play with a combat mechanic consistently or reliably. So that's why I think orbs should be guaranteed on any skill but also tuned down as if that was the case with them retaining their current strength then the game would be easy as hell. But making it not RNG based would incentivize players to interact with its depth in my opinion. That's all my thoughts on that topic so let's move to the greatest flaw in the tech test, the lack of fembo, I mean the story. Now this is gonna be brief as hell because the technical test ended what seemed like midway through the story. So I can't judge it as a whole because I'm yet to experience it as a whole. But I can say that so far the early chapters reminded me a lot of Arknights' early chapters. Now if you've ever played Arknights, you know, that shit is not a compliment. Though it's true, it seems one to one. The starting chapters of Arknights drown you in exposition so much to where you don't really understand what is being said. Granted, it's all set up so chapter 6 and beyond can be some of the greatest shit you've ever read, but that doesn't make the early chapters any better. In Enfield, it feels like the characters are waterboarding the administrator with information due to their amnesia, but because they say so much, it made me not able to really take in that much information. Like, at the beginning, your boy was fine, but with every new cutscene saying even more information about the world, I started to drift away from the story. Like, they talk about a ton of the factions and Talos too, but since they don't do a good job of showing them off, it really comes in one ear and out the other. That's not to say I believe the story is ass, as again, I feel like I've only seen half of it. But that half spent a lot of time throwing knowledge at me, but didn't spend time letting it stick. Though there is an intel menu that gives you summaries of the world. So if you've ever felt lost, you can open up that and give it a look. And I love shit like that existing in story heavy games. Especially live service ones where you may not remember what happened last chapter as there was a couple months in between them. So that system is a W. But it still doesn't help how the story we got now hasn't done the best job of sticking. As the current story just feels like go to X, then Y, then Z as you're told about the world. Now I imagine having more story will make the exposition stick and give us payoff for what was being said, but if the story remains the same on release then I can imagine the beginning chapters being a slog to go through for most people. However, the voice acting helps a ton in making the story easier to digest. Not every line is voice acted, but the majority of the main story is and it's also in two languages, English and Chinese. In the future they'll probably add Japanese voices. And the voice acting we got now is really nice, there wasn't any performances that felt off to me. They got a really solid cast, but I also can't say that any performances blew me out of the water as I haven't seen any deeply emotional moments where the voice actors can really shine. So all in all they're great and I want to see more of their work for Enfield, or I suppose hear more, but that's generally my thoughts on the plot. And in the future I hope we can get more knowledge on the connection to Dark Knights. All we know right now is that people use a teleporter in the northern tundra to reach this new planet, Talos 2. Then they spent years establishing civilization on this new planet. Oripathy still exists but is easily treatable and somehow clones are a thing, which is why we have Angelina. That's basically the summary of the connection and I'm wondering what they'll do with both worlds being connected. How they'll play with that concept. I don't really got many answers now but I am interested to see where the story will head. It's an entirely new world, a fresh start with a world that is just beginning to develop. The potential for what to do is limitless and I really want to see where the story is headed. I mean when I saw the preview of the game more than a year ago I didn't even know what to expect. 
but I didn't fucking expect this shit would be a thing. Let's talk about the base mechanic. Now, I'm not 1000% sure of this, but I'm pretty confident in saying this. Hypergriff must have seen all the jokes about the base and Arknight still being in beta for more than three years, and that caused them to have malice behind making this system. Whenever I need to recreate an ant colony for the sake of my trading station, I can hear the faint voice of Hypergriff in the back. It's almost like, via laying down more conveyor belts than there are stars in the sky, I can hear the developer speaking to me. Yeah, you punk ass bitch, all the fucking whining about all oh, the base is still in beta after three years. Nah, bitch, you the one still in beta after 20 years of your damn life. With every new grinding unit placed. The fuck you complaining about the base is still in beta, bitch? We know your brainless beta self wasn't able to be doing that shit on your own. Every planting unit dropped. You were gonna cry to kill for him to make a guy to save your ass after saying for three years you wanted this shit to be more complicated. Every bus load giver and load taker, I feel it. You should be thanking your damn lucky stars that shit is still in beta. You wouldn't be able to handle the next level. Their hopes in this system, their dreams, their aspirations, what they want this game to become. And my god, is it beautiful. I'm rather surprised to say this, but I really love the base building. I haven't played any games like Factorio prior, so this basically took my first time playing this style of game. And I find it fun as hell to automate production lines. Quite honestly, I was viewing the main story as a way to unlock new areas so I could then place down my mining rigs on them. I might not be American, but I was fully embodying the American dream with my capitalism. Now, if you'd love to do this, I don't know. I found this shit amazing, and this system sold some of my friends on the game. Like that ass. They looked at the combat and went, that's right. Then looked at this and demanded a release date. In case you're worried of it being too complicated, it honestly isn't. I found the tutorial eased me into it and I was never terribly confused about anything. Though even then, if you're still worried, I'm a million percent sure someone is gonna upload a guide to the most optimal base build. So you can just follow that worst comes to worst. I mean shit, it's the Ark Knights community. Motherfuckers make guides over nothing. The easiest shit. Like paradox simulations, who needs a guide for those? Ignore the fact that I've watched a 90% of them. Even aside from guides, the survey brought up the option of being able to apply user uploaded blueprints. I don't know if they'll do that, but fuck, I would love to see it. Another thing I would love to see is making structures easier to place. It feels a little clunky on PC, and the idea of how it'll be on mobile is, uh, fucking terrifying. So hopefully the base building can be improved in that aspect. One thing that won't have any problems on other platforms though is the UI. It's perfect. Shit looks nice and is really easy to navigate. They fully cooked with the UI. But going back to the base system, I wouldn't say it's overly complicated. I'd say it's enjoyable to go through and I want to see more of it. But there does exist people who will look at this abomination me and three lines of cocaine has made and say, yep, fuck that. Nah, I ain't doing that. So the ability to copy a user upload a blueprint would be really nice. Now, when it comes to actually explaining what the fuck is happening in my base, uh, homie, I'ma keep it 100 with you. I don't remember what was happening when I made this. That three lines of cocaine joke wasn't entirely fiction, because I don't remember shit of making this. The base system isn't complicated, but boy did I make my base overtly complicated. The one thing I didn't mess around with too much is the building outside of your hub base. Yeah, put simply, you connect relay towers further outwards, then connect those to pylons, which power whatever structure you've built out there. In my case, it was really only mining rigs. Yeah, what can I say? I'm going for the high score on ecological footprints. But I did mess around a little bit and made zip lines to quickly get to faraway areas. And it was really nice seeing how areas could be optimized for traversal with the ugly abominations I created. Though I didn't mess around with it too much as I was not that attached to traveling the environment. In case you're wondering what the exploration in this game is like, I'd say it reminds me of Honkai Saw Rail, but with bigger zones. It's not really an open world game. You go to an area, explore through it, slaughter the wild, life, then go to the next zone. Now in terms of design, the areas are nice. They don't feel as vast as an open world, but they don't feel linear either. They hit that sweet spot for me of, it's not too much at once, and it's not fucking Final Fantasy X's railway map design, which makes every area nice to explore around in, except for one big thing. Yeah, let me pull you through a story. One time on stream, your boy decided to go past a fence. I noticed that the jump pad wasn't working, but to its left there was a bunch of buildings I could parkour on. Naturally, your boy took the 4-3 penguin looking ass administrator and and had her scale the buildings like Batman. And when I had finally cleared it, made my way over the trials, tribulations, and turbulations, I had one last jump to make to reach my goal of passing the fence. One last hoorah before victory. I hit a fucking invisible wall. I thought I was a genius, a modern day Einstein cause that bitch was born back in the 1800s, yet my exploration ate shit because of an invisible wall. And let me tell you, there is a lot more than just that invisible wall. Take this place for example. The blight was blocking off my path, and to get rid of it I needed to destroy that ball over there. So I took the American approach and decided to bomb it. I threw my homemade pipe bomb and in midair, God slapped it down. Yeah. 
there's an invisible wall right there, out in the open. The zones we go to are fun, but it's stuff like that which makes me not want to really explore them all that much. It also doesn't help that there's not many puzzles to be found in the overworld. A lot of exploration results in you just going around to find the ethereum chest or new mining spots. But to get to those locations, all you really do is just run around. Not necessarily with freedom either, as the invisible walls make it feel like we're meant to follow the path the developers intended instead of making our own whack-ass path. Now there is some stuff in the locations like puzzle spots that I really like, and I wish there was more I personally find those enjoyable to go through. There are Zelda-esque dungeons you can go into, and I like solving the puzzles in those, but I wish I could see more puzzles present in the overworld. And aside from the puzzles, I don't feel as though the areas look that unique. They are all kind of just desaturated to me, and I don't feel that much of a visual difference between the areas. With the full release, we'll probably notice more of a visual difference in the areas. As in the first trailer, they were deadass in the Sahara, but the technical tests didn't bring us there. So on release, the areas will probably look more unique. Aside from that, they're enjoyable to go through in scale and level design. Design, but I would like to see more puzzles or things to do in those areas aside from just marking off a checklist of collectibles and placing down oil rigs. And stuff like invisible walls needs to be toned down so the player doesn't feel as restricted in their exploration. Though what we got now is a great baseline to add more onto it. As again, the zones are really fun to go through, but more can be done to really elevate it. One thing that is rather perfect though was leveling. I don't know if it was made to be quicker as the tech test is only 10 days long, but I never found the game to be that grindy. Leveling up characters was really easy. You just go to the rift that gives EXP, basically rifts are just domains, and after one or two runs you'd have enough to reach the next promotion. The only problem was getting plants, basically just materials for operators to eat. There weren't that many sources of plants, but with more areas that problem will be fixed, and even without that there's a planting section in one of the zones, where you can just go in and plant your own heroin, I mean resources. Have them grow and get a steady supply of them. There are also weapons you can level up and those aren't really grinded to max out either, though you will probably need the gotcha for the 5 star weapons. I say probably because in the tech test we didn't have gotcha to do, we just bought the units with in game roll currency. So I can't I can't tell you what the rates are as I wasn't able to roll, much to my dismay. And there is a potential system, but I can't tell if it's like Ark Knights in which it doesn't help that much and can honestly just be ignored, or if it'll be a huge power boost to a character. Though I can't say that I was able to get 4 star weapons by just playing the game, and they weren't much weaker either. Like these two lances don't have that much of a difference between their effects. And when it comes to gear, the effect bonuses we've seen so far have been basic. But the way to get the gear is pretty interesting, all you really gotta do is just make it. That's it. And it has a chance to be made into a higher rarity. There is some variation in the stats of the gear you made, but it's not grindy at all to fully level and gear up a character. The only thing that's really grindy is weapon essences. So these essences drop from enemies at a low chance. You can then use three of a lower rarity to build a higher rarity essence. And that higher rarity has random stats, and by using three of the same rarity, you can make that same rarity essence again, just with different stats. And getting essences is a pretty low chance, and there are multiple different ones. They can have skills which boost certain effects operators can do. This system seems to be where most of the grind will be focused, the end game. So I really want to see a riff made just for the purpose of farming essences or for their chance to be increased. Because the only way to get them right now is to just go around killing stuff. Other rifts like the ones that give EXP can also drop essences from kills in those, but I'd be down to see a rift have a higher chance to drop them whilst costing sanity, instead of running around committing genocide for the sake of a 1.2% attack boost. Overall though it is really easy to level up characters whilst it seems like most of the grind will be put into the essence system. And I think that's a good balance so new players can level up their favorites while still having a goal to go for. And honestly, there are a fair bit of favorites to level up. Cause deadass, these designs are really damn nice. Ember in particular, but that's cause your boy has a gigantic bias of red. Though in addition to having good designs, the character models look really good. And the environment looks great graphically while still having the game run really well. Cause straight up, for whatever reason, when I booted up the game, it started with 4K quality. Now here's the thing, your boy has a 1080p monitor. Straight up, I don't know if it was even running in 4K or if it saw how dog shit my monitor was and decided to just downscale it. But I can't say that even with that being the case, the game never notably dropped frames except for like one time. Which is also why I hope the game can go above the 60 frame cap when it releases and also has a higher graphical quality option. As I said, it looks great, but since it also runs great, I want to pump up these settings and see how high this bitch can go. Though it's really impressive to see how well this game runs in just its technical test. I didn't really know what to expect from it. If it ran with a lot of hiccups, then I'd understand. But overall, from the technical test, it feels like the game has a sense of what it wants to be and is already 
really close to achieving that, whilst running really well. I know in this review I talked about a fair bit of flaws, but overall I kind of already love the game. I mean, there was a lot I'd like to see improved, like making orbs not RNG based, making combat more interactive, improving the story, and making Exia a character in Enfield. But what I've played so far has been really fun and I just want more of it. I can see the potential this game has and it displays what it can be at full force at times. Like look at the final boss in the tech test. This is how I view the potential of the combat system. Imagine getting to fight a boss of this quality or even better at the end of every event. This shit is cool as hell. Imagine fighting your favorite villain from Ark Knights in this style of game. That shit would be raw as fuck. Having Patriot throw spears at you at the speed of sound, measuring up against a gigantic steam knight, fighting a god of the seaborn or a gigantic pink sheep. That is why I believe this game will be amazing. We've seen how well Ark Knights has gotten as a game, how far it's come. Not to say its launch was rocky, but instead to say it started good and continued to get better. Gameplay, character, story, it's only improved, and as a result of that it's become a game many love, myself included. And I have so much faith that Enfield will take the same route. It does have problems. The story isn't that interesting right now, connection back to Ark Knights excluded. The gameplay needs some function like dodges and blocks, whilst the orb system shouldn't be highly tied to RNG and instead a consistent thing you can play with. Exploration is too restrictive with the invisible walls and the areas don't feel too different from one another. Whilst the base building honestly doesn't have that many flaws, I kinda just love it. But that is why they did a technical test to see the feedback from the community and improve the game before it releases. Based on Hypergriff's work with Ark Knights, I'm confident in thinking that the game will fix these flaws before its release. What we have now is a great foundation for an amazing game to take root. I came into the tech test hype for the game, but I had no clue what to expect, and in my time of playing it, I really enjoyed it. I don't know when they release the game, but I can say that when it does release, I'll be there to play it. Because my main thought after playing the game for a week is, I can't wait for the full release.